You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. This is Andy Tanner, your host, and this is where we do our very best to make investing simple. Fabulous show. It seems that every week we just we have guests that are better and better and really more appropriate for uh, for the time. And uh, this is a very exciting guest. His, his name is Thomas P. Fartanian, and he has written a book that is so much fun to read. Uh, it's called 200 Years of American Financial Panics, Crashes, Recessions, Depressions, and the Technology that Will Change It All. Uh, his bio is a uh, hundred miles long. He's had the chance to work uh, in the Reagan administration. He's worked in technology. He's worked in cybersecurity. He's had decades of experience on the front lines uh, in understanding monetary policies and the, the, the interconnectedness between Wall Street, government, Main Street, and, and just general, uh, you know, the general milieu, the stew of what causes uh, financial panics. So with that, uh, Thomas Vartanian, thank you for being on the program. Andy, thank you for having me. It's terrific to be here. You're, you're going to find as we get to know, as, as we get to know him, um, his credentials are, I mean, your, your CV is pages long. So we'll uh, take that journey with you. And let's start a little bit about with your journey. And you can start wherever you want. <laughs> you can start with I was born, you know, uh, such and such a place and grew up. But tell us a little bit about your journey about what brought you to the point where you've decided to, to pen this book. Yeah, Andy, this book is really 45 years in the making, which was essentially my career as a lawyer in the financial services business. And just to give you a little bit of context, and a little bit of color and texture. Uh, I was a young lawyer uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, working for the control of the currency, which is an agency that regulates all the, the big banks, the national banks in the country. And uh, I had an opportunity to become the general counsel of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and the FSLIC, which were the primary regulators of the savings and loan industry in 1981. And I took that opportunity uh, largely because I knew the chairman quite well, who was a Salt Lake City boy who got appointed to be chairman of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board by uh, President Reagan. And we sat down for our first briefing in March of 1981. And, and the reason this is so important now is because it, it mimics and mirrors everything we're sort of feeling now in terms of economic stress. So we sat down for our first briefing as chairman and general counsel of the two agencies that regulate the savings and loan business. And we were told at that time that all 4,500 savings and loans would fail within the next 24 months at then interest rates. And the interest rates, of course, uh, when I, the day I was sworn in as general counsel, the six month key bill was 14 and a half percent. So there was enormously high interest rates. Inflation was at 12%, enormous stress in, in, in the business. And we were told that every single one of the 4,500 savings and loans that we were to regulate would fail within the first 24 months wow. of, of our tenure. And that's a pretty scary thing. I was a 31-year-old lawyer and, you know, not exactly the most experienced guy in the world saying to himself, what did I get myself into? And as, I, as we began to deal with the problem, I asked the inevitable question that almost anybody would ask, how did this happen? Now, the story that you will read and the story that we were being fed by a lot of people at that time, fraud. journalists, Congress, was there was fraud, criminality, and just basic negligence throughout yeah. the savings and loan business. And that, that's the story that everybody used as the cover story. The real story is a lot more complicated because when I ask the question to myself, how do 4,500 institutions fail all at the same time? The only question, the only answer you've got to come back to is that's a systemic failure. Yep. That's not fraud. That's not negligence. That's a systemic failure. So what was the failure? So I started looking at what had happened. And what I concluded was it was 20 years of boneheaded uh, policy mistakes 
that led us to the savings and loan crisis in 1981, 20 years. I mean, for example, in 1966, Congress decided that it wanted to stimulate housing in America. And that has been a disastrous conclusion every time they have tried to do that. Every time a Congress or the president has tried to increase housing in America, it has caused some sort of aberrations in the market. Well, this time what they did is they imposed Regulation Q on savings and loans, which meant that they couldn't make pay more than 5.5% for their deposit. And that concept Crazy. was that if we, if we cap their liability side, then they can lend out 30-year fixed-rate mortgages, and that's all they could do, 30-year fixed-rate mortgages at a very low rate, and that would stimulate housing throughout America. And that's what they did for the next 20 years. Well, guess what happened when, at the end of Jimmy Carter's tenure? Well, inflation went over in the double-digit area, and interest rates went into double digits, and that formulation began to disintegrate because now you had an average savings and loan. The day I was sworn in, the average savings and loan had on its books a 30-year fixed-rate mortgages yielding 7% and was paying 5% for its money. Now, the 7% yielding 30-year fixed-rate mortgage is then, in 1981, in a 15% rate environment. So automatically, that 7% yielding mortgage is now worth 50 cents on the dollar in a, in, a thir- in a 15% interest rate environment. And so a cavalcade of problems like that created the savings and loan crisis. And, and, and I said to myself at that point, well, if that could happen with savings and loan, how many other times has it happened in the history of this country? And I went yeah. back and I looked at all of the financial crises from 1819. And Andy, here's the, here's the interesting point, which I'm sure most readers don't know and was shocking to me. The United States of America, which has the most comprehensive regulatory system, the most sophisticated and complex economic and monetary system, has had more financial collapses than every industrialized country in the world but Argentina. And you have to ask yourself, how does that happen? Especially to to the largest, most prosperous one, right? Where there's just uh, there's just abundance and trade and consumption. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and you know the answer the answer really comes down to is that financial crises are caused by a complicated mix and stew of economic factors and ups and downs in the economy that are distorted by by governmental regulations and governmental policies, and so. While politicians might think something is good for the economy, forcing it on the economy has inevitably caused some sort of distortion that has created havoc in the markets over these last 200 years. And it's that distortion which which interrelates with the normal economic factors in the marketplace. And you end up with something that you never intended to have in the economy. And ultimately, it generally results in some sort of financial collapse and a panic. And the big losers in that uh, tend to be the, the U.S. citizens who have to pay for uh, yeah, the, bail out. the system. So in your book, it's, first of all, uh, just let, let me tell people, go to Amazon.com right now and, and purchase this book. It is, it's 200 years of financial panics, crashes, recessions, depressions, and the technologies that will change it all. And the reason this is going to be a staple, you know, on my, you know, in my library is first of all, I, you know, personally, I just love the history. It is so interesting to find out, you know, where your heritage and your country has been and how things were uh, through the, the 19th century. But also it's extremely instructive as we face incredible, uh, an incredible uh, milieu of different factors a, a perfect storm really uh for for you know economic difficulty and one of the things that that i think is very interesting about the book that i'd like you to comment on here is 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 you talk about striking a balance and on the one side you have people who say get the government totally out all they do is fool with this you mentioned there were four things that you know that that 
Yeah, well, let me just read from it. Too often government policies misidentify financial incentives in the market that encourage, one, long-term risk-taking, two, mispricing of risk, three, the mitigation of risk to non-regulated portions of the economy. And here's the big one, I think. Uh, last but not least, four, uh, the, the Fed put, the hedging based on the expectation of a government bailout. And so we get the government putting their fingers into these things. And some people say they should be totally out. Some people say that they should regulate anything. And the, the striking balance or the, the interesting thing that comes out in your book, particularly when you write about Andrew Jackson and, in 1939, I don't want to be a spoiler, but just imagine everyone if, if there were no loans to buy land, um, no loans to buy that, that type of land for property. What if you had to buy land with cash? Well, I mean, it would, it would absolutely destroy prices. Uh, if you had to show up with a bag of gold to buy land, you know, there's no leverage. You'd have to wait. And yet, on the other hand, too much debt. Uh, you know, J- Andrew Jackson wanted the federal Federation out of it and wanted states to handle this stuff. And then we had wildcat banking where the further out where the wildcats roam, the the, the less you trusted the bank because you had to, to go there to really have it backed by species. So this balance, could you speak? I know it's a long setup for a question, but, you know, speak to that to that balance of uh, of having the government involved to regulate, but also their incompetence that they've shown time and time again in doing so. Can you speak about yeah. that balance? Yeah, and I'll tell you, balance, Andy, is, is the quintessential goal in terms of financial regulation and it's the one we get wrong just about every time and because and the reason we get it wrong is because we let politics affect the balance as opposed to economics Mm -hmm. and i said very often when i speak you know uh the reason we make these mistakes with the economy is because uh as far as i know money is still green it's not red or blue yeah and we when you try to affect the economy and you try to affect money by uh, imposing either red blue red state policies or blue state policies on it, you end up with, again, distortion. So the, the problem has always been balanced. And, 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 and you say, you pointed this out correctly. There are people who argue the government shouldn't be in financial regulation. And there are people who argue the more regulation we have, the safer it will be. And both of them are absolutely wrong. First of all, there's no time and place in the history of man where it was appropriate for people who take other people's money not to be watched. Yeah. I mean, that's just insane, right? You give your money to somebody, they ought to be supervised. They ought to be regular. They have to be watched because we know from the history of scandals throughout the world that if they're not watched, that money disappears. Somewhere, someplace, somebody's going to get an idea that they, you know, that they can take off with that money. And all you need is one guy and one bank or one crypto firm or one hedge fund, and, and the whole thing comes tumbling down because it's all built on confidence. Yeah. So first, first premise is financial services need to be regulated because you're entrusting money to somebody else. The question then becomes, what should that regulation look like? And we always get it wrong because we overregulate so much that we end up regulating the wrong things for the wrong purposes at the wrong times. Now, let me give you the, the prime example of what's going on now that is the main issue, I think, in terms of managing risk. And we're seeing it unfold today in the crypto market. Yeah. Because what's happened? We, we overregulated banks. We underregulated crypto. So where did the risk migrate to? It migrated to the places where there wasn't regulation. Yep. And now we have all this risk piled up on the crypto side that's falling apart. So the example I'll give you, I, I think, is, is, is pretty stark. All of the banking and securities laws that we have in this country were passed between 1932 and 1940. The whole shooting match was installed after the Great Depression, and that's still the structure that we operate by today. I mean, now, we're still using, the, we're still using outhouses in some places <laughs> in the thirties, yeah, right? So, yeah. So this is the outhouses of financial services. 
So when that system was created, banks were the center of the financial services universe. 95% of financial services ran through commercial banks in the 1930s. And so it was normal to have a bank-centric regulatory system. Well, let's fast forward to 2022 and ask yourself how much of the financial services business now revolves around banks. And it is today about 35%. So we've gone from 95% to 35%, but the regulatory structure hasn't changed. So we're now using 100% of our prudential regulatory resources to regulate 35% of the financial services market leaving the other 65% largely unregulated and largely where the risk migrates to because it will not be watched and it will not be supervised. And that's part of what happened in 2008 as all of these subprime lenders were unregulated and all of that subprime lending migrated to places that weren't supervised. And so what I point out is, is it's not that we need no regulation. It's not that we need more regulation. It's the, we need smart regulation mm-hmm. that's directed at the risk. And that's where the whole question of technology comes in. How can the regulators, how can the government use technology to regulate? Because the one thing I know from having been in the government for eight years and then practicing a lawyer as a lawyer before the government for another 30 or 40 years is, is that the government doesn't use, doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the knowledge to use technology. So for example, Mm. there's no, there's no concept of using AI algorithms to better regulate and predict what's going on in the economy. What the regulators do is they regulate and supervise what happened. They don't predict what Mm -hmm. is likely to happen. So ask yourself, is it surprising that we have financial collapses when we're always regulating, looking in the rearview mirror, you you opened up. So you've opened up a whole plethora of things that that are just fascinating to discuss. To discuss, first of all, uh, and we live in an era now where you can you know say nasty things to Supreme Court justices. I I love robust debate, but I'll I'll uh, make make sure we're respectful. So I I'll I'll let you answer this question respectfully. You you sp- first of all spoke about you know, the politics of it. And of course, that's going to sway decisions and it it creates an interest beyond maybe what is logical. It becomes rhetorical rather than an epistemological discovery attitude of what should be done. We say, no, we have an agenda. We have a, a rhetorical, you know, ends in mind. So there's the political factor. One of the things you also say that I thought was pretty bold and I, I, I'd like you to clarify who, who we're talking about. It says financial literacy must be improved so that less regulation is necessary and more financial innovation is permitted. When you look at uh, Chairman Powell or Chairman Yellen or even back to Bernanke and, and Greenspan, are those guys, in your opinion, you know, let's respect their office, but are they guys that are financial geniuses or do they put their pants on one leg at a time like the rest of us? I mean, how do we, there's another part in your book, I, I'll probably not quote it pr- properly, but it's important to put in place people that maybe are not just, uh, oh, I'm probably putting words in your mouth, maybe not just academics, uh, people that have been on the, people that really understand this well. Where would you rate the, the financial literacy and intelligence of, of the monetary policy side of, of, of this equation T- today. Yeah. I mean, do you think they've, you know, made innocent mistakes? Do you think they've been influenced politically or do you think, man, they're just not competent? Well, I think, look, I mean, it's a complicated question. So let me, let me break it up into yeah. parts. First of all, when I talk about financial literacy, I'm largely talking about most consumers. The electorate? Yeah. I mean, look, most people come out of high school and college and they've never taken a course on having to be able to balance their own checkbook. Right. Yeah. And so when I was writing, I was at the control of the currencies office in 1976, writing the fair lending act, the regulations, the truth in lending regulations, equal credit opportunity regulations. It occurred to me that I was writing these regulations that would apply to all of these financial transactions around the country only because we were trying to protect people who didn't understand anything that was happening to them. 
And as, I, as, as we wrote those regulations, that they became hundreds and hundreds of pages, right, of, of regulations, which by themselves are self-defeating when they get that long, you realize that the only way that you can protect people who don't know, don't understand the financial complexities they're dealing with is by having a, a traffic cop on their shoulder, on each person's shoulder. And that's not feasible. Brilliant. It's not possible. Brilliant. So, so it, it occurred to me that with all the money that we were spending on writing regulations and, and, and bringing enforcement actions against institutions to stop them from taking advantage of, uh, of consumers, the best way to get to that goal was to help consumers help themselves. And if we just had a process by which every consumer was required to take certain uh, financial literacy courses in high school, it would change the need for all this regulation dramatically. Yeah, when I, I have sons that are age 14 and 16, and the, the first lesson we sat down and, and taught them was the basic you know, elements of a financial statement. Uh, you know, income expenses, the balance sheet, assets, liabilities, and really important is the statement of cash flows because now you understand your operational earnings, you, you know, what you're doing to give value to the world, but you're also understanding your investment goals and your debt goals with a statement of cash flows. And just that basic understanding, I mean, you're right, we don't even get to the first one of balance in the checkbook. And I would imagine... If you went back to, you know, to the early 2000s, where you had the, you know, zero down, no doc stated income loan, <laughs> you know, which basically means anyone can get a mortgage now. Right. right. Um, some education would have gone, you know, I don't want to be a victim blamer because there were predatory loans. But if a person is educated, they might think that variable rate through or that interest only loan through a little bit better. And then also, you know, when you talk about, consumers and in my mind a lot of that means the electorate is if you go into a voting booth i wonder if we went jaywalking like jay leno used to do and just say to people who's jerome powell uh what is quantitative easing mean to you right what does it mean to right. expand the balance sheet of the united states <laughs> right what is the uh you know what's the 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 effective rate uh, for overnight lending and what does that have to do with anything these people wouldn't have a clue so they're going to listen to what makes them feel good, uh, which for some people is helicopter money right now. Now you mentioned crypto, and I find this interesting. I'd like your comments on this. I've heard or read, whether it's accurate or not, that about half of the Bitcoin transactions are going back and forth through Tether, where Tether's acting somewhat like a money market. It's easier to move, uh, you know, if I, have a, if I have a money market, I can buy and sell stocks and the money has a place to go back and forth in. If I have Tether, I can buy and sell Bitcoin. The money has a place to, to go back and forth in. So on the one side, you have this Bitcoin, which is this uh, robust uh, ledger that is uh, self-audited through an incredible network of, of auditing, constantly being checked, uh, an open ledger, decentralized. But on the other side of that tether, you've got it totally as centralized as you can be, non-audited, uh, and, and we don't even know what they're using to keep from breaking the buck. We don't think it's commercial paper because there's so much tether that someone would have to say, yeah, I'm doing, you know, there'd be some producers of commercial paper that say, yeah, I'm uh, doing business with them. And I don't think they're using treasuries or reverse repos. So... What do you say about, you know, you talked about the confidence. Crypto was supposed to be this great hedge against inflation. And, and in Argentina, you know, my feeling is those were the people, you know, your own currency is going poorly. Inflation's nasty. Where can I fly? I fly to crypto. But for some reason, the U.S. dollar, whether it's because it's the you know, world reserve currency or whatever, crypto did not hedge it. So can you speak a little bit about that tether idea acting as a money market and how that might affect crypto and also that confidence issue. Yeah. So what I learned looking at the history of the financial crisis, I hadn't been involved in going back to 1819 was exactly what you just referenced. And that is confidence is the key to a financial system. A financial system only works 
if there's confidence by businesses, individuals, and the government in that system. Mm-hmm. And when that starts to wane, it's like a drain pulling the water down, you know, and it all disappears. And, and everybody says, well, wait a minute, what happened? And crypto is the poster child for that concept because confidence by itself in the financial services market is always a fleeting element. Yeah. And look at the 2008 crisis, right? Everybody thought that subprime loan mortgages and subprime mortgage-backed securities were the bee's knees until they weren't, right? Until they looked at the default rates, until the default rates became real and 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 the cash flows dried up. And then people said, well, wait a minute. You know, we've got to reverse gear. And it's that moment when an economy reverses gears that everything stops, liquidity pulls back, credit shrinks, and we see as the tide goes in who's swimming naked, yeah. right? Because yep. that's when that's when we really see who's taking the risk, who's out there, you know, uh, really unprotected. And so, in the subprime crisis, at least at least there was value in the homes, right? There yep. was some value in those homes as collateral. So, at the, at the, in the worst case, if the subprime borrower defaulted, at least you could sell the home for some value and get some collateral value to pay off the mortgage and pay off the investments made by the mortgage backed securities holder. But the crypto world is totally different when you're different, when you're talking about confidence, there is no intrinsic value to any crypto coin. Now, stable coin tether has tried to deal with that by backing those coins with government securities, treasuries and, and the like. But, We go back to what I said before, who's watching that? So Tether was uh, was the subject of an enforcement action by I think the New York State authorities as well as the CFTC. Yeah, they they settled without admission of guilt and you know, that whole thing. Right, And, and they, and it was alleged that they weren't really backing their crypto uh, coins with uh, government securities as 100% as they said they were. And I think uh, there's a Bloomberg report on the yes. Tether action that basically goes into great detail about this and says that when the, when the CFTC investigated, they found uh, a substantial number of days throughout a month uh, where there wasn't 100% coverage or anything close to 100% coverage, and that would cause, in case of a liquidation or a bankruptcy at that point in time, it caused tremendous uh, difficulty in terms of people trying to get their cash. So. What we know about crypto is it, it functions on a very thin read of confidence. And what that says to me is that margin for error in that business is very, very small. And we've now seen at the, at the, at the instance of the first reductions in crypto value and the first failures and the first hedge funds to go down in the crypto world, what do you do when the underlying instrument has no intrinsic value? Yeah. The only thing you can do is sell before it gets to zero. Right? <laughs> yep. And so that's a self-fulfilling prophecy that creates a run. And so if you, th- if you take all the financial panics we've had since 1819, uh, the crypto world sort of sits out by itself in terms of having no intrinsic value to rely upon, which means there's a smaller margin for error. And we're now seeing that margin for error sort of be play out in the marketplace as the market is shifting. And, you know, we don't know where this is all going to end up. But I saw a terrific quote, Andy, and I don't know who to ascribe this to, but uh, I saw a terrific quote about crypto the other day. It said, anyone foolish enough to pay real money for the privilege of moving nothing around inside nowhere to accomplish no purpose deserves to lose their real money. (laughs) Well, you know, I, I don't want to be vulgar, but it, a shorter quote was from uh, Charlie Munger, who said it's a turd. So, <laughs> and Buffett about <laughs> fell out of his chair. He says, you know, he, I, you can see him. I say, hey, Charlie, I know you're, uh, I know you're fourth. You know, you, you speak your mind, but we're we're being broadcasted on Zoom, buddy. So, yeah. On the other side of crypto, though, I look at blockchain, and I, you know, why aren't we using that to vote? And it's an incredible technology, has a big carbon footprint. Interesting stuff. Let's talk about the Federal Reserve today. Um, you have 
Uh, when I and you can educate me because I'm a student. When I look at the Federal Reserve, I look at four accounts on their liability side of their balance sheet. You got the general treasury account where the treasury, you know, can put money for a while when they sell bonds or I suppose mm-hmm. collect taxes would go in there too. You've got member banks, which, you know, if a member bank can make a deposit of the Fed and get 0.25% guaranteed, it's probably not going to lend for less than that uh, for a risky deal, keeps the floor and interest rates great. Uh, and they, they, you know, started paying that stuff. They used to say, hey, you have to put in reserve. But now they'll say, now we'll pay you to, to put in excess reserves. And they've changed the, that language, you know, and combined the two now. The, the third one I look at, which is really interesting, is Bernanke, you know, back in 2010, when they said, how are you going to unwind this and drain these things? He said, we'll use reverse repos to do it. Reverse repo market is $2 trillion now, I believe, a day. Uh, that's phenomenal. And then finally, you've got currency in circulation. So I look at those four. And I don't know which one, I would imagine currency in circulation and deposits on demand are what can really drive consumer inflation uh, as opposed to asset inflation. But I look at those four. You had about $750 billion before the, the 08 financial crisis in currency and circulation. Um, now the the four totals of that balance sheet of that liability side is at nine trillion. I mean that, that that's an incredible. I mean it takes my breath away when I look at that chart visually compared to you know I look at 08, you know maybe two thousand nine ish blow starts blowing up in two thousand ten, and you can see attempts to unwind it. You'll you'll see them raise some interest rate uh, not working. Let's do another round of QE. And and in the fall of two thousand nineteen. You know, it looked like Chairman Powell even before COVID kind of said, "You know, what? we're we're gonna we're gonna loosen this up again." So the attempts to unwind this almost seem to have been saying, "You know what? We've gotten away with this. Um, we 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 haven't needed to unwind it. Maybe zero interest rates we've had pretty much over the last twelve years is is kind of what we have to have now." Can you do a Volcker type of move to fight inflation? where our debt to GDP ratio is 120 now. Um, yeah. I, I just think, my gosh, they've ro- people said they kicked the can down the road. No, they've rolled a snowball up a hill that has yeah. gained mass and height, in my opinion. Am I just a chicken little, or, or do we have some Paul Revere here warning <laughs> legitimately? No, I, I think, uh, and I've written a number of op-eds uh, on this subject, I, I think we're all underestimating the damage that's been done to the economy and, and the Fed's role in that, frankly. Uh, and, and I'm not ascribing venal, you know, intentions to anybody. I'm sure. just saying a lot of mistakes have been made for a lot of reasons. Some of them are political. But I think you put your finger on, on, a, on the real problem here, and, and that is, if you think about, and, and I focus on that number you just raised, a $760 billion Fed balance sheet in, in 2007, $9 trillion today, that, that suggests $8 trillion of money that's been, that's been printed by the Fed. Yeah. Particularly when you look at the fact that in the last, what is it, 24 months, yeah. uh, 60, 60% of the Treasury notes have been bought by the Fed. Yeah. So... What you've got here is you've got the Fed printing money, buying treasury notes so the, so the treasury can finance itself. The f- treasury then pays the interest to the Fed, which then t- takes that interest, pulls out its, its expenses, and pays the money back to the treasury. Yeah, magic. <laughs> now, right. Now, you know, I think traditional economists would sort of describe that as, as a banana republic. Yeah. And in terms of what we're doing. So... I look at sort of five different elements of what the Fed has done over the last 20 years as having created an environment where I'm not sure, frankly, that raising interest rates anymore is, is the solution that Paul Volcker thought it was. In, in May of 1981, uh, my chairman and I went over to see Paul Volcker and his, and his general counsel. We'll talk about the savings and loan crisis. And Paul told us what he was going to do with interest rates. And we weren't smart enough at that point to understand the, the enormous cataclysmic effect that would have on banks and savings and loans. But he was making some hard decisions about what had to be done to the economy to dig it out of that enormous inflationary economy. 
but it's much more complicated today. I mean, we've had, we've had 10, 12 years of quantitative easing, which is essentially a nice word for saying the Fed has been supporting the markets by buying corporate securities, mortgage-backed securities, and yep. treasury notes, printing money to do so. Then the Fed has changed the way money moves throughout the banking system by paying reserves on the de- deposits on reserves, which in a sense means but the banks have every incentive now to give their money to the Fed as opposed to lend it out. Well, and, and can I interject here is what I thought was fascinating is, you know, you are you really have member banks, you know, the large national banks and member banks that can do that. But when they started saying, hey, repo, reverse repo, guys, well, now now you got the world, don't you? I mean, don't if, if I'm a money market uh, and I don't want to break the buck and I need places to put money that gives me a place to go. And if I'm in the international bank and I can participate in the Fed's reverse repo, now I have a floor. I mean, effectively, by adding the reverse repo, they can put a floor on world interest rates. I mean, is that going too far? Well, I think that's right. And what I, what I sort of say, what I, I have a section in the book called the, the, the Managed Economy, and it's on this subject. And, and my theory is that over the last 50 years, we've gotten to a point from – I sort of start with that meeting we had with Paul Volcker in May of 1981, and I say from that point forward, the Fed has sort of created a mechanism where it choreographs and manages the economy. But the problem is they have managed it to the point where they can't reverse what they've done. Yeah, yeah. Right? So they've, man- they've managed us into a, into a sort of a, a situation of oblivion. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I have to say, you know, they have helped us get out of some crises, and they have helped uh, eliminate some collapses that might have occurred. But you have to ask yourself the question, are we really now in a position where we're heading for a cataclysmic collapse yeah. because of all of those interim actions that have been taken? And I would, there's a great book, Andy, that I read in, when I was doing my book called The Rise of Carrie. Uh, I've read it. By, I've yeah, read isn't it. Isn't it terrific? It's fabulous. In and, fact, he's been on my podcast as well. It's absolutely fabulous. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of it's about FX exchange trading, which I don't understand, but the points that they did make, which I do understand and I am in thorough agreement with, is that you cannot bail out the large portions of the economy over the last three great financial panics in this country and not have the markets react to and act as if they're always going to be bailed out. Mm-hmm. So I spent the last 30 years of my legal career representing the largest banks, private equity, and hedge funds in America. Uh, and I know how they think. Those are very smart people, and I know how they think, and I know how, I know how they try to always get the angles in the marketplace. And if you tell them that if you take enormous risk, you're going to make a lot of money because you'll make a lot of money for a while, and that means you'll get very high compensation because you're making a lot of money for your clients. But at the end of that 10 years, everything's going to blow up because of all the risk you've taken. But don't worry, the government's going to bail you out. (laughs) So (laughs) if you know that, and you've seen that, the last three financial crises in this country, you're going going to adopt your financial strategy accordingly. Well, and you you have to, I mean, this this brings long-term capital management to mind, right? And, and Jim Rickards and his crew yep. Yep. And, and going to the Fed. And, and all of a sudden the Fed starts to change their levers. I, I think the Wizard of Oz is an overused metaphor, but the fact of it is they have a knob that they pull and when it screws up, they invent another lever and then they invent another dial to take care of the problems that lever caused. And then they got to have another switch here to take care of the lever that messed up the dial. And pretty soon, you, you know, they, they, their power has grown tremendously. Uh, just yeah. since 08, they don't do the same things today. <laughs> you know, mortgage-backed securities. Um, Janet Yellen is, you know, in Japan, they've, they've done this. Now their, G, their debt to GDP is closing in on 300. But in Japan, they've said, well, let's do equities. I mean, uh, is that the next thing? They're going to say, well, let's support. That's crazy to me because we already have detachment from fundamentals in the stock market. We have tremendous yeah. detachment. And if you allow them to buy equities in the same way they could buy more, well, how do you, 
There, there's no fundamentals behind that price increase. It's like 401ks have people buy things on schedule as opposed to fundamental analysis. There's just this constant money flowing into the stock market from people that just figure it should go up regardless of whether it's attached to fundamentals or not. So this- That's exactly, this, exactly right. Because now, you, you, know what I, you know what I sort of equate that to, Andy, and that is we're, on, we're walking the plank yeah. and we've got two directions we can go in. We can go back, which will be painful, but we can keep walking out to the edge until we <laughs> get to the end of the plank. And, and who we can knows? keep walking out further and further because it's the easier action. To take. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's would, like Munger says, who knows how long that plank, how much long, more plank do we have left is that we don't know. Yeah, so here's the frustrating thing for me that I was thinking about when I was writing my book, particularly in the sections about the Fed and, yeah. and the mass economy. And, and I was shocked when I did all this research going back to 1913 when the Fed was established. There are more economists who are negative about the Fed than positive, and I was surprised about that. But the interesting thing and the frustrating thing for me when I was writing this book, uh, as I was seeing what was unfolding, uh, on, on March 15th, uh, 2017, I interviewed to be the vice chair of the Fed. Yeah. And I was in the White House for 90 minutes that day because uh, I'd known Stephen Mnuchin from working with him on the transaction where he got into the banking business. And uh, I spent 90 minutes in the White House with Stephen and Gary Cohen and a few other people. And Gary Cohen asked me one question at the end of the interview. And he said, what would you do if you were vice chair with interest rates? And at that point, you know, interest rates were effectively zero. Yeah. And I said to him, Gary, we've managed this economy too long. We have got to let interest rates rise gently and naturally to a normal, more traditional level because I don't think 0% is a normal traditional level. Unsustainable. Now, I, I grew up in a 5 to 6% environment. I lived through a, uh, where interest rates hit 21% in yep. 1982. Yep. I said, uh, I'm not sure exactly what's normal, but I know zero isn't normal. And he said, well, why would you let interest rates rise? Maybe this is the new normal. I said, and I said something that, that I still believe in, that is, if we don't let interest rates rise, what power does the Fed have the next time to deal with the next financial crisis? Exactly. They, 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 have, they have reserve requirements. They have QE. They have rates. They, they have a limited number of tools to use. Their magazine is empty. They, they have no bullets in their gun, right, yeah, when you're so at zero. That's it. They're done. Yeah. They're done. All they've got right now is the bully pulpit. By the way, I, I'm appreciative for your epilogue because you spoke about this White House meeting in the beginning of the book and then went in and I says, well, what happened? <laughs> well, well, why'd you say no? What, what happened? And I thought it was actually an informative epilogue at the end where you say, you know, you took this 150 steps. And I thought the, the, the thing that disheartened me about it is you, you listed some reasons about why you said, you know, I think I can do better. Um, you know, remind me of when the comptroller general quit and decided to go out and just, you know, kind of use a bully pulpit. But you said, I don't know if I want to put my family through a, uh, a Senate confirmation process. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. isn't that a shame? You know, isn't that yeah, a shame? You know, I've been around Washington 40 years. I've been in the government eight years. Uh, I've been asked to be, go back in the government three or four times. And I knew as I left the White House and I laid out the agenda that I've laid out in the book, I knew there would be no political will to do it. I knew that they wouldn't want to extend the capital. Yeah, political will. Political capital, financial capital to make those changes. And I said, I don't want to do this job just to sit there and make fancy speeches. Yeah. I want to correct and help the system. And I knew as soon as I walked out, that wasn't going to happen. And it didn't happen. And I didn't want to be a part of, of just continuing the same sort of structure that is obsolete out of touch and guaranteed to create more financial collapses. So that's why I decided I wasn't going to do it. And I think they decided they didn't want somebody who was going to try to do it. <laughs> let, let, let's do, let's play this political game. I'll throw a couple of uh, baseballs at you. See if you can hit them. And I'm sure you can, cause they're right over the plate, but I'm going to play and I'm going to advocate for MMT. I'm going to try to sell MMT. Okay. Cause mm -hmm. this is the stuff that, uh, you know, I, I read, uh, I read, Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, and the, the concentration of bad ideas 
in that book is breathtaking in in my personal opinion but maybe i'm just wrong and you know have bias against uh against printing money for nothing but think about this argument we talked about red state blue state all right what about us versus china in the book in your book, you say, you know, you have five large banks in, in the world and four of them are in China. And there's this feeling that we want to keep the upper hand Cold War wise or, or you know, you want to be the most prosperous nation. It, it gets you, a, it's certainly a better position. A couple of things. Let's say China's going to develop AI. That's like Sputnik. I mean, that's that's who gets to the moon yep. first, right? So right. can you, if, and you mentioned that war bring in in your book war brings prosperity every single time uh it 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 helps an economy so if you decide there's a race or a a a sort of coldish war who let's say whoever gets to ai first rules the world i mean it's just that way isn't it worth spending or printing you know in world war ii gotta get an a-bomb let's uh let's get our debt to gdp ratio to 150 and that's okay because it's a matter of survival so if you have, you know, $170 trillion in healthcare you got to pay, why not print enough money to cure diabetes and cancer and reduce that number? If you've got, um, if you've got, you know, all these billions of people in China that, well, we got to have better education then because they just by numbers will have more geniuses. So we got to spend money, have free education so we compete with them brain wise. If they get to AI first, we're cooked. We got to print lots of money and spend and invest uh, to get to AI. What do you say about that? There, there's, there's some of the things I'm hearing. We, we have to print this money and, and use the power of our big economy to, to go into debt as collateral because otherwise we lose politically to China. What do you think of that? Well, I think we are losing, number one. It's a question of how long that takes, and I'll, <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. And number two, uh, we do have to spend, but it's the same balance problem. We have to spend right. We have to spend smartly. We just, we're spending on the wrong things for the wrong reasons at the wrong time. And let me give you an example. So I am a thorough believer in the, in the likelihood that artificial intelligence, whoever dominates artificial intelligence will dominate the world. I mean, we sit here as foolish Americans thinking that since, so, simply because we've been the sole superpower in the world for the last 20 or 30 years, it will continue that way. It will not continue that way. The Roman Empire is still not here. Right, right. British right? Empire fell. Yeah. Right. And so you've got to keep running at 150% all of the time. Just because you get to the top doesn't mean you stay at the top. So if you look at China, what's going on in China? China now controls 75% of the rare earth minerals on the face of this planet. What do rare earth minerals do? Rare earth minerals uh, make, make silicon chips, among other things, batteries. And without access to rare earth minerals, you're basically, you're cooking, your goose is cooked. Yep. And so we've now sat back and let uh, China control 75% of the rare earth minerals uh, in the world in, with deals in Africa and South America yep. and so on and so forth. Second of all, they are focused on being predominant in artificial intelligence by 2030. Not yep. 2080, 2030. And they are part of the way there. And, of course, they're using it to do a monitored social system. Oh, where they have the data, right? I mean, if you have no personal yeah. rights, the IAI is about how you data feeds AI progression, and they have no rights, right? They can monitor your cell phone charging habits over there, right? That's what they're doing now, right? So, And, and they're spending, at the time my book went out, I think I said that they were spending at a rate of 10 times what we're spending on artificial intelligence. So, you know, when we talk about spending money and blowing the budget, it's not going to build artificial intelligence and be dominant there. Then quantum computing. The next state of, of computing is quantum computing, whether it happens in the next 10 years, in the next 30 years, uh, but it is exponentially quicker than anything else. So what are the Chinese doing? The Chinese are collecting all of the data on the planet that's currently encrypted, because if they're the first to get quantum computing, you own they will the stock be able market. to encrypt. Yeah, they will be you able to encrypt all that information. Yep. So let me let me give you an example. In today's world of digital signatures that that encrypt and protect all the data that goes back and forth, assuming that the normal twenty fifty six bit encryption RSA bit encryption that's used 
It takes a state-of-the-art computer today, 300 trillion years, to do a brute force attack on 2056-bit encryption. So that's pretty good security, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, a quantum computer with, uh, I think, 4,099 qubits, and we don't have a, a quantum computer yet with anything more than 256 qubits, but we'll get there. With 4,099 qubits, that computer could break RSA 2056-bit encryption, not in 300 trillion years, in 30 seconds. Oh, my God. That's, that's just, that's incomprehensibly, I mean, that's breathtaking. That takes my right. breath away. So if, if that's your goal, and, and, and you can change the world by having a quantum computer, uh, you're going to do it if you're a country like China. So I, I, yeah, imagine the, model, the trading the is, with that kind of speed. Uh, you know, you figure Wall Street is mostly done by you know it's high frequency trading and automated now with algorithm. Can you imagine how you would dominate the world financial system with that kind of speed? Absolutely, you dominate everything. You dominate yeah, everything. all data. You dominate all finance. There'd be you, you decrypt everyone's stuff and have everyone's secrets. My gosh, that's that's right. That's like. That's kind of like a movie, man. That's that's wild, crazy. Yeah. And so, so I think all the I think all the survival chips are on the table right now, and and they're going to play out between now and twenty thirty. Uh, and I don't think our leaders understand that. I don't think they're spending money in a way that suggests they understand that. And I don't think they understand the risk that we are at at this point in time with what the Chinese are doing and what they're trying to do to dominate the world. And if they dominate the world, they'll dominate us yeah. the same way they dominate their citizens. It'll be a total surveillance world. Unbelievable. It, it's an amazing time. The book is essential. Uh, go to amazon.com. You know, I, I, I invite people on the podcast that I feel could give value to people's lives. And so Often people say, well, don't make your podcast an infomercial. For, but I absolutely, unabashedly recommend the books that I'm reading when I find value in them. And, and I will tell you, if you could have dinner, this is how I always sell books. I say, if you could have dinner with Thomas Vartanian, would you pick up the tab for dinner and drinks? I know I would, and I hope I do when he comes to Salt Lake because you'd like to pick his brain forever. Well, here is a chance to not only pick his brain, but really study it for much less. And so go to amazon.com today and pick up, a, a, it, it's, it's fun to read because the history is so rich of 200 years of American financial panics, crashes, recessions, depressions, and the technology will change it all. It is a, uh, it's almost a primer on financial destruction on how it works. And, and it, what's fascinating is throughout these uh, crashes that you, that you chronicle, uh, there are common themes and common threads to where as we look at this big one now, uh, we're, we're kind of looking into the past, staring at the future a little bit as we stare at the future. So I, I, can't, I can't recommend it uh, strongly enough. There is so much more we could speak about. I, I do need to ask one more question, and then you've been so gracious with your time. Unbelievable. One more question. The, the Bretton Woods Agreement uh, put the United States in a fascinating position of being the world's rever reserve currency, where you know, you know buy gas, grain, much of that is done in U.S. dollars. My feeling is the world's had enough of that. And, and you'd have thought in 1971, they'd have said, well, the whole reason we, you know, agreed to this was you were backed by gold. Now you're not, you know, it's taken this long, but I feel there's, there's an antagonism, uh, from the rest of the world towards the U S like what makes you guys so special now? Um, if the, first of all, so it's a two part question. A, is that true? Um, is, are the days of the U S dollar being the world's reserve currency numbered number one? And then number two, uh, if that's the case, the demand for dollars, if, if, if they are dethroned from that position, I can't see but what the demand for dollars would absolutely be obliterated. And now we have, you know, trillions of pieces of paper. We got, you know, 50 billion notes out there, various denominations that nobody cares about. And, uh, and then also you have a shadow banking industry that's outside the Fed with offshore money. 
uh, where the Fed couldn't control that with reserve requirements anyway. So could you speak to the idea of the U.S. dollar and its global positioning as the world reserve currency? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the great sleeping giant of issues out there in in the monetary world. Um, And in my book, I talk a little bit about Bretton Woods and where we are today. So for your readers uh, and your listeners, uh, Bretton Woods occurred in 1944 after the war in which all of the nations got together at this little hotel in New Hampshire to try to figure out how to manage the economy, the global economy, since it was in such a mess since Europe was devastated. And as a result of the Bretton Woods Agreement, over the strong objection of most other countries, I mean, they just weren't going yeah. along here for fun, the United States came out with the global reserve currency and the uh, IMF and the World Bank had a co- headquartered in Washington, D.C. All three of those things happened. And why did they happen? It happened because the United States was the, the most powerful country left after the war. We're the only one that had a military. We're the only one that had an economy. And we had the most gold reserves of anybody on the planet. And, and you know, there was an old commercial where I lived in New York, Money Talks, Nobody Walks. That was, the, that was it. Yeah. And so that happened. And at that point in time, the dollar was the global reserve currency, was the money used for international trade in 90% of the transaction. So ask yourself, and I happen to know the answer because I researched it, what that number is today. The, the, the U.S. has a global 60. reserve currency is somewhere around 59% today. Okay, all right. So it has dramatically dropped from where it was. And I wrote a, an article about a, an event that happened uh, oh, about six months ago. Well, no, I think it was just after, probably five months ago, just after the war in Ukraine broke out and Russia invaded. There was an announcement, an announcement that, um, that the Saudis were going to sell oil to China and for the first time in, in crypto. history, yep, I remember. Except the yuan or crypto instead of yeah. the dollar. Yeah. So ask yourself what happens in this world if if we don't have a dominant dollar throughout the world economy. <laughs> and just as an example, we lose the ability to do economic sanctions if the dollar isn't the global reserve currency, if it isn't the dominant financial structure in the world, if other countries are using uh, central bank digital currencies instead of the dollar. We lose the ability to do economic sanctions. If we lose the ability to impose economic sanctions, what weapons do we have left besides military? You know, China. Right. China's in first place. They really are. I thought about, I was thinking about this the other night. I was looking at the strength of the ruble against the yuan, and it's, it's much stronger against the yuan right now than it was before the Ukraine war started. Right, and I thought right. to myself, okay, Putin has a hot war with Ukraine. Uh, Putin has a cold war with the U.S. Well, China understands trade, and they understand currency war. They understand devaluing your own currency to benefit trade. Putin, well, I don't know how chummy he is with China, but if you're China, you're like, <laughs> his ruble's growing, and he has to trade with us. I mean, China is... They are in the best position in that, in all three of those, four of those countries, China is in the best spot. Yes? If the ruble yeah, is I'm- strong, if the ruble is now like, wait, like I looked at the chart, it's Putin jacks up interest rates, rubles way stronger than it was against the one before the war. So I don't know that China's chummy with Russia. I think they're just smiling at the whole situation. Maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, uh, look at all the U.S. companies that are in deals with China, that are indebted to China. Look at all the countries in the world that are using China to deploy 5G technology and things like that. I mean, its influence is now global and it's now globally economic. So it's not not smart economics to oppose China. And that's, you know, they're very smart in terms of what they're doing and how they're doing. I mean, they could Uh, sanction in a lot of ways if they wanted to. Absolutely. I mean, you know, if you read Hank Paulson's book about the 2008 crisis, uh, you know, you get a very strong flavor that it was foreign investors in Asia who uh, persuaded him not to put Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac into receivership and put them in conservatorship instead because of the economic havoc it would create yeah. for investors yeah. in U.S. debt. Wow. The, the final thought I'll leave with the listeners, and then I'll let 
Thomas Vartanian leave his final thought is right now there's a lot of push for systemic change where people want to change circumstance and I'm all for that use your freedom of speech hold up your sign hopefully you do it respectfully march for whatever causes you want but understand that a change in social circumstance happens often at a geologic pace. There is so much discussion, so much hatred, so much anger, so much division, that to change circumstance systemically is very difficult. You still have freedom to to say, look, regardless of whatever legitimate injustices I've suffered, regardless of whatever victimhood I can absolutely prove, you have the chance to, to go for personal triumph. And I think that comes from personal development and learning. And, and I don't have much faith anymore in, the, in a systemic solution. That's my feeling, that I don't know that the Titanic can be righted now. And so it's up to me to learn as much as I possibly can to position myself individually, from independent from, from government and businesses, to do whatever I can for myself and my family. And I think part of that is reading 200 years of American financial panics, crashes, recessions, depressions, and the technology that will change it all. Uh, become a reader. Become a ferocious reader so you can learn these things for yourself. Help, you, help the electric get smarter one person at a time, but particularly learn how to position yourself. Uh, what are your final words for our listeners? And you've just been incredibly gracious with your time. Uh, what, what would be your final words for someone uh, about to read the book and, uh, and, have, and has been listening intently. Yeah, Andy, I wrote the book because I firmly believe that the way to avoid future financial crisis is for us to educate ourselves about how they've occurred in the past. If we understand the cavalcade of complex factors that have been dumped into that stew that have created financial panics, many of which are under our own control and many of which evidence political uh, views if we can understand that and we can moderate our, our um, activity and our actions in the future to be a little smarter, we are going to be able to avoid the financial collapses we have run into so much over the last 200 years. I mean, I go back to that, to that statement about us having more financial panics than every country yeah. but Argentina. I mean, that's amazing to me. That shouldn't be the case in America that has the most sophisticated regulatory system. And when we have federal regulators, we have state regulators, we have hundreds of them all over the place. And still we have these financial collapses because we're regulating the wrong things at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. And so my message is if we can get smarter about the mistakes we've made in the past, we won't make those mistakes in the future. Fantastic uh, interview. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did thoroughly with Thomas P. Bartanian. Uh, what a podcast. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy show where we try our very best to make investing simple. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.